Good morning again to all of you that are present and all of you that are viewing because we put our messages out on the internet for those who cannot make it into service for some reason or another. The title for this morning's message is, It's Not Too Late. Yeah. Hey, they asked me, do you need to put the yet on there? And the answer is, yes. <coughs> Pardon me. It is not too late for you to choose Jesus Christ, to make a difference in your life, to change how you're living, to become who God is calling you to be. We have a, um, a parable that we're going to discuss this morning in the Gospel of Matthew, the uh, 20th chapter of the first 16 verses. And in this parable, it is Jesus who makes the point that it is God who gives us our ultimate value, regardless of what resume we have accomplished during our lifetime, no matter how much seniority we feel we have in the kingdom or wherever we are pursuing the grace of God. Nothing trumps our acceptance of God's salvation promise, even at a deathbed profession of faith. With that in mind, we do understand that it is never too late in this lifetime to turn towards God. Uh, like we said last week, there's an old saying, we need, to, we need to let go and let God. See what you think as we read the parable recorded in Matthew. A story that helps us understand. It's called the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Chapter 20 verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them to his vineyard. About one third, about the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and again about the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, we went out, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day and doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. So he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. And so the workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only an hour. And you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered them, Friend, am I not being... Am I not being unfair to you? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give a man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first. And the first shall be last. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. The human side of us goes with the overworked and underpaid whiners. They came late to be paid because they came early to start. And it seems to us in our human side that it's only fair. We work more, we should be paid more. But here's the breakdown. If you work only to receive a reward, according to Jesus, you will finish last. On the other hand, if you have intentions that are to serve 
in obedience you shall be first. Oh, now I get it. Somehow, it seems to me in my humanness to be a little bit lopsided, don't you think? Human logic, human logic cannot be applied to God's kingdom plan. It just can't. The way we think and the, God, the way God thinks seem to be different in many times. But we, we must never, never covet the things of our neighbors. We should not look at what they have and think, gee, that could have been me. In, in my humanness, the first thing I was thinking when I was reading this is, well, maybe next time. I won't even show up till the 11th hour. That's the human side of me. I can make a denarius and work an hour instead of working all day long and still making a denarius. But, but here's the kicker. And here's one that uh, it reminded me of the underlying meaning of Jesus' parables. It's not about salvation. It's not about gaining eternal life. It is about the humble joy at the calling of others to the kingdom. We've talked all morning about what it means to understand God's love. It, we've talked about all morning what it takes for us to be overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit, to go out into the world and share the love because there's plenty more to go around. It's not in God's plan for us to compare each other's diligence in an effort to see who's the kingdom's best. Even the disciples got trapped in that. Let me sit at your right. Let me sit at your left, Jesus, when the kingdom comes. It's hard to top Jesus. And it's a better goal to please God. You see, that's what we learn as we come together as a faith community in fellowship and in fun and, and in food, but most of all in worship what it means to be a child of God, what it means to please God with the life that we lead. lead. Now, according to some surveys that were taken just last year, that more, more than 50% of the people are truly satisfied with the occupation, with the lifestyle, with the, with the journey they are on in this world. Satisfaction is liking what you do. It's kind of like the icing on the cake. I'm earning a living, I'm providing for my family, and oh, by the way, I love what I do because it's been proven over and over it's truly not about the money. The money is the first step to satisfying the needs, but it, it pales in comparison to satisfaction. The workers are seeking something that is, that is a mutual benefit between their employer and their work to understand that they mean something in the things they're doing. They're not just performing a task that goes unmerited. So it's how you perceive the actions of Jesus in the story that he told as a parable of the vineyard owner is, is his real point not determined by our resume by our paycheck, by our seniority on the job? No. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with God's grace. And contrary to the, the popular view on life in this world, it, it's not about climbing to the top of the ladder. Yeah. In God's world, it's about the one who stays back and holds the ladders while others climb. The good to all this is that God is extremely generous. Like in the children's message with the overflowing pitcher, God creates enough love to share and share and share and still be revived. I have a little personal testimony to share with you this morning. It's, it's about my story, true story. When we left the mainline church to start Turning Point, I had to revisit my ordination. Even though I had performed all that was necessary of me and been ordained by one of the 13 worldwide bishops of the other denomination, when I left, that title became null and, and void. So I went on the internet to look for credentials. You may have been there too. You, you may have decided, well, I'll just get a 
a preaching license that I can do weddings and I'll have a little part-time job. And when I found on the internet, there's this plethora of, of opportunities. Now here's the way it works in many of the cases. You send in, or even some of them have you fill it out online, a, a, a questionnaire. There's only about four or five questions. Questions like, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe in the Trinity? Do you believe that God loves you? Several other questions like that. Mail your $25 money word to this address and we will send you your ordination certificate. Oh, by the way, what, what is it that you would like to be called in your or, ordained life? If they had opportunities from um, pastor, reverend, district superintendent, bishop, the only one that I could not find for the $25 charge was Pope. I think that one was reserved for someone else. But in my research, what I found was I wanted something of me. I wanted something that would truly uh, endorse the work and the studies that I had performed. And I found one that said, essentially, we're different than the others. Send us a copy of your education, your degrees. Tell us a format of the things that you have taught and learned. Give us a resume of your life's journey. And we will put it before a board, review all of the facts, and get back with you. At the end of that process, I was accepted as a candidate. They sent me a package to work on where I was to write out some uh, plans of worship, some plans of teaching. And with all of the credentials and the way I responded, they, they blessed me with an ordination. My journey from the beginning of turning a life of corporate world and finance into a world of, of pastor has been long but filled with joyful and blessed experience. And it is that education and those qualifications of, of the actions of my life that allow me to be your pastor. And, and oh, by the way, I chose Reverend. Call me Pastor Kent, but my ordination is Reverend not bishop. I didn't consider bishop, though, but that's another story. So when we question with things, when we wrestle with things, what if we saw our lives as a, a, an opportunity, a total opportunity just to serve? You know, that's what Jesus did. Jesus served people by, by lifting them up. You see, life in Christ is the solution to joyful living no matter what vocation you have chosen. So if you have Christ in your heart and your whole purpose is to lift Christ up before the world, you will be filled with an abundance of joy. Now here's the deal. I had in my mind, when I read that parable that Jesus taught, it was all about salvation. It was all about eternal life. But in, in almost every situation, there is one side and then there's another. The theologians of this day come together with the truth of this story from Jesus about the workers and the vineyard owner. There's two interpretations of this parable. And we know that we cannot earn our place in eternal life. The Apostle Paul told us that, and the Apostle Paul called that works righteousness. You can't work yourself into heaven, right? Yeah. Right? Right. Right. right? Right. We learned that. Paul taught us that. We believe that. You can't work yourself into grace because grace is free. And our lives are changed. We have an impact of, lives, of our lives after we receive that grace. And I am convinced that almost everyone will at some point in their life seek out God in a very special way 
no matter what the situation that drives you that way, you will find a time in your life when you are seeking out Christ to be a part of your life. Unfortunately, there are some that death proceeds that opportunity to accept Jesus Christ and therefore are not eligible for the gift of grace from God. Now, when I was preparing for this morning, I read a question that is necessary for each of us to find. We know without doubt that we can trust Christ in God. We, we understand that figure, the one part of the Trinity, the Jesus Christ. And we know that we can trust Jesus Christ because of his proven record. He died for us. He was resurrected and ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand. And when Christ tells us grace is available just for the asking. Do you hear that? Grace is available just for the asking. And we can choose then between a life of sin and a life of faith. Now here's the part that I think runs through our mind. There was a comedian one time who said that he, he wants to sit always in an airplane on the window aisle because if anything happens and they start going down just before they crash, he wants to take off his seatbelt and jump up. What is it about sin that beckons us to live a life of sin? What is it about sin that brings us to a point where we say, what if grace is free and available anytime I want it? But why not let me live a life of sin first and then I'll ask for grace? It's a, it's a choice that we have to make. Uh, Constantine was the bishop in the three and four hundred A.D. time frame. Even in his journey, Constantine said this, Lord, save me, just not yet. We played Kenny Chesney's song, everybody wants to get a, go to heaven, just nobody want to go now. What is it about sin that lures us in to live in a way that's in opposition to God? Is sin more appealing than faith? That's a question for us to ponder. Would you answer um, differently if there were no heaven and no, no hell? Would you use that as an opportunity? Would you use that as a reason to be unfaithful to your family, to your spouse, in the way that you live? Would your morals disappear? There's an old adage that says virtue is its own reward. But the opposite is also true. And mature reality tells us from the lives of those who have lived before us. We seek to do right, not to avoid judgment, because living a virtuous life is more pleasing to God. And oh, by the way, it's more pleasing to others around us. God is hopeless, hopelessly in love with you. God is hopelessly in love with all of humanity. God made the, the um, ultimate sacrifice to free us from that draw of sin. So, it's not too late. Yes. And all the children say, Amen. Amen.